It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4.1. We did get all the way through 3, didn't we? Galatians 4.1. Galatians 4.1. Now, before we got to Galatians 4.1, we were talking about equal privilege and equal opportunity. And there was one last point I should have given you before I ended to cinch it up. And that is, the Bible doctrine we miss today is the blessing we miss for tomorrow and eternity. The Bible doctrine we miss today is the blessing we miss for tomorrow and eternity. And the reason is, we don't know when our life's going to end. That's why. Why should you listen to the Word every day? Whether you're here or not, it's not my business. But why should you listen to the Word every day? Why should you listen to Bible doctrine every day? For one reason, the Bible doctrine we miss today is the blessing <laughs> we miss for tomorrow and eternity. And the more Bible doctrine you miss, the more blessings you miss out on not only in terms of the escrow blessings for time, for when we're alive, but also, even more importantly, for the blessings that we miss in eternity, which goes on forever and ever and ever. It's not like a beauty queen who re receives her crown and gets all excited and cries and then has it for a year, and then it goes to another beauty queen. In heaven, if you receive a crown, it's permanent. And along with it are permanent blessings. So the Bible doctrine we miss today is the blessing we miss, we miss for tomorrow and eternity. Now we begin in Galatians 4.1. Galatians 4.1 is where we will begin, but before we start there, we must get six principles on adoption, because this is what Galatians 4.1 will talk about. And again, Galatians 4 will be logical. Apostle Paul is going through this like, it, like a lawyer. So principle number one, the biblical connotation of adoption, which was based on the Roman arist aristocratic function of adoption in the time when the New Testament was written, is not the same as we consider adoption today. So number one, the adoption in the Roman Empire under their aristocracy is not the same as the adoption that we have today, so we must understand the Bible in terms of the time period in which it was written. Adoption today is different, and adoption then, was, they had a different system for it. So that's principle number one. Now, principle number two, we deal with the word son. Now, like with the word love and with the uh, other words we've seen in the Greek, they've had two different meanings. And uh, they've had two different meanings even with the word son, such a basic word as son, S-O-N. And we've had technon, technon in the Greek. And that's transliterated. Technon. And in... Uh, the ends look like these almost in the Greek language. That's technon. And it means son, but it's a different meaning. This is a minor child. This is like a uh, child who has not yet weaned off of his uh, mother. A young child. Actually, it refers to uh, children under the age of 14. Technon children under the age of 14. And in the Bible, as way of analogy, the Apostle Paul will use technon for unbeliever, a child under the age of 14. He will use it uh, as an analogy 
as someone under the age of 14. And this child, by analogy, is under the law. Technon is under the law. Technon, under law. And the law restrains people. The law is a restrainer. We have laws in this country to restrain us. If we didn't, this place would be chaotic. For example, thou shalt not steal. We have those laws. You cannot commit murder. That's a law. And if you do it, there will be consequences. So this is referring to the unbeliever under the law. And the law for the unbeliever keeps him in order. And there are unbelievers in this country, and not all unbelievers are going out being like crazy people. There are unbelievers who follow the law better than believers. There are unbelievers who do not steal. There are unbelievers who have never committed adultery, while there are many, many believers who commit it all the time. But the law is a restraint for the unbeliever. And this is how Paul is going to make the analogy. Now the believer has a different word. For the believer, he's a son, but for the believer, it's huios. And that's about as close as we can come in transliteration. H-I-O-S. It's about as close as we can get. Even then, there might be some question as to that, but in terms of transliteration, as close as we can get, huios in the Greek. And when we are huios at the moment of salvation, we receive our manhood. Remember, that goes to the toga. You're now in manhood. You've now believed, which means what? And the analogy Paul's going to make is, before you were 14 years old, now today we would have to say 21, but at that time adulthood was thought to be 14. But for our sake, let's say this, 21, because at 21 that seems to be when you share every right that everyone else. And the only added right at 21 is the drinking of alcohol, I believe. At 18, you're really an adult, but they still don't let you drink. But at 21, you, re the, you're, uh, you uh, break free from all these other laws. So technon here it was for children under 14. And that means that they were always under certain authorities to keep them in line. And they were raised just as when you're raised, you're under certain rules. Now, when you're 21 and you're out on your own, you can stay up till 4 a.m. and not call home. If you're out on your own and you have your own house and car, etc., and you want to stay out till 4 a.m., even though mommy wants to know where you are, you're free not to call home. And mommies will always want to know, but you're free at that point. Mommies and daddies will want to know where you are even when you're 29, they'll want to know. But you're free, you see. And so at the point of 14 in the olden days, they would say, all right, you're a man now. You have every right that a man has. So guess what? You're no longer under our laws. So exit out. You're not technon anymore. You're not under the law. Now you're huios. You're your own man now, son. Make do with it what you can. You're your own man. You got your own choices. You may screw up, but you're not under our laws anymore. That's the way it was in the ancient world. It's not the way it is today because uh, children seem to mature more slowly under our system. So today it's, what, 21. 21, you're not under the laws of your mother and father anymore unless you live there, then you are. They bought the home, purchased it at all, and all, etc. But then we have Huios now. Now under Huios, you're no longer under the law, and that's the whole point. Now that you've believed in Christ, you're not under the law, and that's the point Paul's making. And he uses these analogies which a lawyer would use. So an unbeliever is technos. The believer becomes Huios, which means an adult son. 
And when you're an adult, you will be treated differently by your parents than when you were children, or you should be. I've never seen a 70-year-old man spanking his 35-year-old son. If he did that, he would be nutso. It just doesn't happen, and it shouldn't happen. So positionally, at the moment of salvation, we receive the robe of manhood. We might not deserve it, but we receive it because we believed in Christ. And therefore, now that we have this robe of manhood, we're not under the law. We have another word, huiothesia, and that's uh, huiothesia. Huiothesia. And huiothesia means to adopt as an adult son. You've been adopted as an adult son, and this is actually what occurs to you when you believe in Christ. You've been adopted as an adult son. Actually, it's H-U-I-O. I got the U's mixed up. It's uh, H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. Huiothesia. And that means to adopt as an adult son. And imputations at salvation are made as part of the ceremony of recognizing that we now have a plan and purpose in life. You see, when they turned 14, they went through a ceremony. When you believe in Christ, you now have a plan and purpose in life. And when you became 14 in the ancient world, the Father would make it clear, you have your own volition now, you have your own property you go do with it what you can. If you screw up, you screw up. And if you succeed, you succeed. But it's your choice now. And all that occurred at 14. So the word quiothesia means to place a son. Now just because you are 15, 16, it, it, this was a whole different culture. We don't even follow this culture. So, so don't even go to your parents tonight and say, But mom, I'm huios. Forget it. Forget it. So the law is for the unbeliever. The law, what this is saying is the law is for the unbeliever. It's for technon. It's not for the believer who is an adult son. So now let's look at Galatians 4.1 so that we can have a better understanding of what it's saying. Galatians 4.1 Paul the lawyer wasn't really a lawyer, but he could have been. He could have been the best lawyer ever, the way he is so logical and sometimes so sarcastic to make a point. Galatians 4.1 Now I keep repeating that the heir, as long as he continues being a minor child, what's minor child? Technon. As long as being technon, minor child, unbeliever, is no different from a slave. And that's true. If you were technon in the ancient world, you were no different than the slave. You had no more rights than the slave. You were a child. You were under the authority of your parents. Whatever parents, whatever law your parents set forth, you had to follow. You were under law. Now, I keep on repeating that the heir, as long as he continues being a minor child, technon, is no different from a slave. That means he cannot make any decisions until he wears that toga, until he passes into manhood. Now, we have similar things today, but it's not really close at all because when they were 14, the parents really said, you're on your own. They really did. And, but uh, I remember when I turned 18, I didn't stay out late anyway, but my mother said, well, now that you're 18, no more curfew. I had a curfew, never broke it, Never even stayed out that late. Never even got close to breaking it. I got too tired. But at the age of 18, she said, All right, you're 18. No more curfew for you. So I went from Technon to Weos. And in this case, it's the same thing in that it's an analogy and that while you were an unbeliever, you were a minor child under the law. So now I, I keep on repeating that the heir, as long as he continues to be a technon, minor child, is no different from the slave. 
though he is master of everything. What's that mean? It means that when you believe, it's all been set up for you. Just as when you were uh, 14 in the ancient world, it had all been set up. Your bank account had been set up. Your escrow blessings had been set up. Everything for you had been set up. And as soon as you believe in Christ, you go out from under the law and jump into freedom and blessing. That's what it's saying. Now, uh, so for one, the analogy is that there's the unbeliever. And as long as the, believer, the unbeliever remains an unbeliever, he's under the law. And he's no better than the bond slave. And then there's an ablative of comparison in which the unbeliever is treated as an immature person. The unbeliever is actually treated as an immature person because he needs the law to tell him what to do and how to behave. And if there was no law telling the unbeliever what to do and how to behave, the world would go just the way it did before the days of Noah. That's why God invented the law. Now, of course, the law didn't come immediately after Noah. For a time there, there was no law, and we went through Abraham and everything else. But uh, when the law came along, there was, a, there was a lot of negative volition, and there was a lot of what you would call lawlessness. And that's why we have the story of the Pharaoh, etc. The world was lawless. The world was going nuts into, there was a lot of Satanism and everything else. And Satan's lawless, so everyone on the earth was becoming lawless. So now the law, and the law was given to unbelievers. And believers too in that in its establishment. But it was made to keep unbelievers in line because they're immature, as it were. They're like little children. And the immature person needs protection from the Mosaic Law. That's why the Mosaic Law. That's why the Ten Commandments. And that's why our country functions under laws. So as to keep the unbeliever and everyone else in line. Now the Judaizers, what they're doing is they're coming along and they're coming up to a bunch of adults. You know what the Judaizers are doing? They're coming up to people who are 21 years old and they're giving them a curfew. They're coming up. Imagine now you're 21 you've got a job or you're in college and maybe you're in college and have a job and you're working hard and you're making ends meet and you have a house and then some somebody comes up to you and says I've noticed you've been coming home at 2.30 and 3 a.m. in the morning you can't do that anymore you know what you would say you'd say I'm a grown man I'll do whatever the hell I want to do that's what you would say but these legalists come down and they say you don't have that freedom. You must be circumcised. You must go back under the law that Technon was under, that children were under. What they were saying is, put on a diaper and be messy. Go back to the law. Go backwards. Go back to before you were weos. Go back to before you were adult son with freedom and go back to child. And that's exactly what the legalists do. And if you go in for legalism, you'll be just like them. You'll be, let, you'll be a grown person putting on a diaper and messing in it. Exactly what he's saying. Exactly what Paul's trying to get across. Now in 4.2, but in contrast, keeps being under the control of tutors. We're still talking about the unbeliever. But in contrast, keeps being under the control of tutors. Now a tutor was also part of the slave contingent of a middle class or well-to-do family in the Roman Empire. And a tutor, they were a combination of a valet and a bodyguard. And what they would do is they would teach their children how to dress, how to groom, how to, you know, you should comb your hair, etc., how to keep clean, and also act as a bodyguard so no one would harm them to and from school, etc. And so this is what a tutor was. And governors, until the date set by his father. And we will know what governors are in a moment. So in Galatians 3.24, we found that the law was a school bus. You have in your Bible, schoolmaster. It's really a school bus. And it was a slave 
that would take the children to and from school. And the law escorts us to the cross, but it can't take us any further. You know, they say you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The law takes an unbeliever to the cross, but you can't make him believe. And that is exactly how Paul is bringing it out. Now we have the word tutors and governors. And so these three words that we've been noting, first the schoolmaster, which is really school bus, then the tutor, and now the word governor. And these three words all are a description of the Mosaic law by analogy. So the tutor taught the child how to dress, how to groom, and he's also a bodyguard to protect, uh, by analogy, to protect the unbelieving world and to uh, protect the human race. Because if there was no law, the human race would destroy itself. And we noted that from the time of Noah. That there was no Mosaic law during the time of Noah and the world went to hell in a handbasket. And the only people left we're eight. And if there's no law, that's the way the world goes. So that's why the Mosaic law was created. But now we're under a higher law. So the Mosaic law teaches the unbeliever how to conduct themselves as far as morality goes. And there are very moral unbelievers. I don't want you to misunderstand that. Because you'll go to church and the first thing they'll say is, Believe and be moral. Or all you have to do to be saved is be moral. But there are very moral unbelievers who are hell-bound. And no matter how moral they are, they'll never become huios. They'll always be technon. Because they're acting like little children and they never move into regeneration. So the governor, as what it says in verse 2, the governor actually administrated the estate of the child in those days and that means that the parents usually the father the one working the parents would put money into an account for their children and it was it would be comparable today like putting your money in the stock market but you have someone a mutual fund it would be like today putting it in a mutual fund so the governor would, be, would handle the finances of a child and it would be a slave they would be a slave but they would be a slave with knowledge about finances and so the, they would be like a mutual fund and the parents would put the money in the mutual fund and then so that's what the governor d would do the tutor was the bodyguard that would take the children to school and groom them well actually they would just groom them and uh, then the governor would take care of the child's finances but all of the people who did this were slaves. They just had different jobs. So in the, in the ancient world, as I've said, you make sure that your children are financially set while alive, not until you're dead. Today we have uh, death insurance so that if both parents die, the children get money and usually held on reserve until 18, etc. Whatever the law or whatever is in your will, that's how it will go. But in the ancient world, if people were capable, they would provide for their children's education and everything else and their life even before they, were, they became uh, adults, weos. But we're, we're talking here more about aristocracy who had the money to do it. If you, didn't, if you don't have the money to do it, forget it. Just get that insurance policy. So in the ancient world, your children were financially set. Now in Galatians 4.3... So also we, when we, talking about Paul and the Galatians, when we were children, now in this case it's talking about technon. When we were unbelievers under the age of 14 by analogy, when we were unbelievers, we were enslaved under the restrainers of the world. Galatians 4.3 in the analogy, as unbelievers, we were under the restraining influences of things like the Mosaic Law, just as minor children were under the authority of their slave overseers. In the analogy, we as unbelievers are under the restraining influences of things like the Mosaic Law. We're also under restraining influences like things of law in the United States. We're under all sorts of laws. We're even under taboos that are restraints as unbelievers. 
just as minor children, referring to technon, are controlled by slave overseers. By analogy, we are under the pedagogues. Again, P-A-D-A-I-G-O-G-S. We're under the pedagogues, we're under the tutors, and we're under the governors, all referring to what the Mosaic Law does to restrain us. So again, if you go back to legalism, you're an adult going and playing in the sandbox. Although I might play in a sandbox too. <laughs> but let's make a different analogy. You're like an adult who goes into a restaurant with a uh, plastic gun and you've got your adult friend there. Maybe, let's say you're both 40 years old. You've got a plastic gun, they've got a plastic gun. And you stand up in the middle of, let's say, pizza buffet and say, I'm going to kill you, boy. And then the other guy jumps up, no, I'm going to kill you. And then pow, pow, pow. And then guess what? Everybody's going to run under the tables. Because these 40-year-old men are acting like children. They're playing cowboys and Indians. It's time to stop because now the police are going to come in. Now, people will get terrified. He, a man stands up even with a toy gun and says, I'm going to blow you away. Now, he might be playing, but you're 40, and it's time to stop playing. And so what this means is they were going, the Galatians were going back to the law, meaning they're going back to acting like children. It's actually an insult that Paul was giving them. I guess the better analogy is when you go to the law, you're wearing diapers and messing yourself. It's a better way to put it. So Galatians 4.4, 4, and that's what most believers are doing. Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the Mosaic law. So again, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent his own Son. That's a reference to deity. God sent his own son, reference to deity, born of a woman, reference to his humanity, 100% deity and 100% humanity, born under the Mosaic law. Jesus Christ was born under the Mosaic law because he was born in Israel, and Israel was under the Mosaic law. He was born at a time, he was born in Israel, he was born during a time when the Mosaic law was in effect, Therefore, he was born so that he might fulfill the Mosaic law. What we must note from this, and it's important, but when the fullness of time was come. Now, what this means is that God the Father picked the perfect time for Jesus Christ to come. Point number one, God the Father picked or chose the perfect time for Jesus Christ to come to the earth. And why is it called the fullness of times? Well, there are several reasons. One of the reasons is because all the religions of the world had proved themselves to not be able to provide salvation. And many religions had popped up all around the world. Polytheism, all types of systems of religion had popped up all over the world. And people were following religion, etc., to be saved. So the fullness of time means that every religion had already popped its head. And you say, but Mohammedism came later. It's true it came later, but it's just a variation of another religion. It just works, 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 works. So the fullness of time here has to do with the fact that any religion after this time will just be a variation of all the other religions, and that includes the religion that will poke up its head in the tribulation. It's just a variation of all the other religions, and it had been proved in the fullness of time that no religion could save man. So that's one of the reasons why it's the fullness of times. There's another re a reason. This was a time when the Roman Empire had reached its peak, or reaching its peak, getting close to its peak. And during this time, Greek was the universal language. Just as today, many people claim English is the universal language. If you were to go to Europe, there would be many people who could speak English, especially Great Britain, of course, but uh, maybe not so much France, but if you were to go to Germany, if you were to go to Spain, if you were to go to some of the other, Italy, other small countries in Europe, you would see that a great number of them speak English. 
if you go to South Africa, they speak English. Australia, New Zealand, all around the world, they speak English. And that day, all around the world, the prevailing language was Greek. And why is that important? Because when Jesus Christ came into the world, there needed to be a great amount of missionary work and evangelism right afterwards. And so, since most people spoke Greek, it was very easy to spread it through that one language. Just as today, uh, the fact that we speak English and the fact that we're a client nation to God means that it should be much easier for us to spread Christianity than others, and it is. And so the fullness of time means the Roman Empire reached its peak. The Roman Empire had made its language Koine Greek as the universal language. So the Roman Empire, also another reason why it's the fullness of time, the Roman Empire was maintaining peace throughout the world. All along its northern border, there was peace. Why? They had a lot of troops on their border. And all around their, the whole realm of their country, which was about the whole known world, there was peace. It's called Pax Romana. You'll probably study it in school in history. Pax Romana. And why was there peace in Rome? Military. A strong military. Not just a strong military, but a large military. One with many, 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 many personnel, people. We're getting the weird idea in this country that we can just start uh, winning wars by computers, etc., by flying these little drones. Well, they're helpful for intelligence, but you always need infantry. And there'll never be in time in history when we'll be fighting wars without people. Infantry, never will there ever be, because we note in the tribulation the blood is going to flow as high as the, 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 uh, the bridle of a horse. What's that mean? There's people involved and lots and lots of infantry. And we're cutting out infantry because we think technology will do it all. And it, it can do a lot in helping. But as we notice, we're spread thin already. And the one thing the Roman Empire could do was secure its borders. And it made it very easy for the uh, Apostle Paul and everyone to go relatively safely. We know Paul got his butt beat everywhere, but he could go relatively safely from one part of Rome, from Spain all the way to the Middle East. Fullness of time. The best time for there to be great evangelism. Why? Military protection. And if you were a Roman, you got special treatment. If you're an American today and go overseas, do you get special treatment? Yeah, especially bad but not especially good. And one of the weird things about all of this stuff going on today is that, well, here's the Roman Empire. At its greatness, it could secure its own borders. But do you know what we do? We can secure the borders of Croatia. We can secure the borders of South Korea. We can secure the borders of Germany. We can secure uh, the, the borders in Iraq to some extent. We can secure borders all around the world, but we cannot secure our own borders. It means we're falling. And when Rome stopped securing its borders, it fell all apart. What we need to do is pull those troops out of South Korea, out of Europe. They're not doing anything there. We're securing another country's border when we can't even secure our own. What's the point? If they get in a fight over there, they don't like us anyway. Let them fight it amongst themselves. What's the point? Here we are securing, oh, securing the borders of Afghanistan, Croatia, South Korea, Iraq, and yet we can't support our own borders. And we're going to send 6,000 National Guard. Nothing, absolutely nothing. It's just, a, it's just a way to deceive us into thinking we're doing something. We're not doing a thing. We're not going to do a thing until there is blessing by association. And when there's blessing by association, then we'll be just as great as Rome, able to handle our own borders, and at the same time whip everybody else in the world. So Rome made it relative. Another reason why this was the fullness of time for Christ to come 
the Roman Empire made it relatively easy to travel. They had the greatest roads ever created until this time. We have greater roads today, but Rome had made it relatively safe for travel around the world. And you say, well, why didn't Christ come now since uh, we have airplanes and all that? We'll note in a moment there's another reason. The other reason is that Christ had to be born in Israel. And Israel was about to go under the fifth cycle and not be heard of again. So Christ had to come to Israel, of course. And that's another reason why it was the fullness of time. You see, in August of 70, 70 A.D., Israel fell. They were wiped out. And if Christ had not come at that point, at the fullness of time, he wouldn't have been able to come to Israel. Another reason I got ahead of myself. But it was relatively safe for people to walk around Rome, go from Spain all across Europe, go into the Middle East, and all of these areas were pretty much safe to travel. Even though the Romans did persecute Christians, it was still easy, easier then than it would be now to go all across the world. Because today, if you go to Pakistan and uh, start uh, giving the gospel, you might be beheaded. Not during Rome's day. So, why did he have to, why, another reason why it had to occur and why this is the fullness of time is because our Lord Jesus Christ had to be born under the Mosaic law so that he could fulfill the law. And remember, the law was given to Israel. So Israel had to exist when our Lord came to the earth. So our Lord came to the earth in the fullness of time and was born under the Mosaic law. Therefore, this was the fullness of times because soon after this, Israel would be completely wiped out under the fifth cycle of discipline. And as soon as Israel is wiped out under the fifth cycle of discipline, so would the law and everything else. But our Lord had to be born under the law so that he could fulfill the law. And once he fulfilled the law and went to the cross and died as a substitute for us, there was 40 years of grace given to Israel and then boom, they were wiped out. So it was the fullness of time for our Lord to come. So you might wonder, why did our Lord come to the earth some 2,000 years ago instead of 1,000 or instead of right now? Because it was the fullness of time. It was the perfect time for Jesus Christ to come to the earth and die as a substitute for us. So that's the meaning of that. Where else are you going to get such a tremendous amount of doctrine out of but when the fullness of time was come? Nowhere. And by the way, I know Galatians has been taught before, but I'm coming at it from an angle with the knowledge of the unique spiritual life that my pastor developed later on in his life. So, I mean, he did Galatians, and it was wonderful, but you're even getting some deeper things than when he taught it because I'm coming from the viewpoint of knowing the doctrines that he taught when he was in his 70s from Ephesians on up until he was teaching in spiritual dynamics. And with all of this new information, you can go back and teach Galatians and, and throw some of, this, some of this wonderful doctrine in there that he didn't have when he taught it because he learned it. It's all, I give all the credit where the credit is due, but the fact is you, you won't get it anywhere else. You will not, not that I know of, and I'm not being arrogant either. Galatians 4, 5. Galatians 4, 5. To redeem those, to redeem those. Now, this is aorist tense, and this means it was redeemed once and for all. We are redeemed once and for all. To redeem those who were under the law, that we who believe, believe here is subjunctive mood in the Greek, and that means a point of volition. It's our choice whether we believe or not. You can't even beg somebody into salvation. It's their choice. To redeem those, aorist tense, once and for all, who were under the law, that we who believe, subjunctive mood, meaning it was by choice, so that we might receive adoption as adult sons. And then here again, so that we might receive adoption as adult sons, again there's aorist tense, and that means that we might receive once and for all adoption as adult sons. 
Meaning, once you are adopted into the family of God, you can't get out of it. You're there, and you're stuck. You've been adopted, and Jesus Christ is not going to unadopt you. You're there, no matter how you act. You see, somebody today might adopt some children, and those children end up to be terrors. Too bad you adopted the terrors. I don't know if the law lets them give them up now or not. I don't know if it does or not. If it does, it's a stupid law. But if you adopt somebody and you decide to adopt them and you're going to keep them, well, the law should say, you made the choice, buddy. I don't care how they act. They're yours now. That's what the law should say. It probably does. I'm not sure on that. But that's the way Christ works in his perfect integrity. So what happened here in 4 5? Galatians 4, 5, we have the word redeem, and that means that Jesus Christ, by living a sin, sinful, sinless life, was qualified to be a substitute for man's sin. And note that our redemption is based solely on belief to redeem those who were under the law that we who believe solely on belief, not we who invite, not we who commit ourselves, not we who do anything except believe. And you know, as many verses that we've gone over that, ju that just say believe, it should be coming very firm in your mind that the people out there today are morons. They don't have a, they call themselves Christians, and maybe they are, but they don't have a clue about what the Bible says. And we're going over Galatians, which is simple, absolutely simple. This is a very simple, simple book, but necessary, of course necessary and necessary for us to learn and to learn these things and to cement it in our soul so that we know how much Paul hated legalism and how much we should have that same thought. And yet oftentimes we want to be buddy-buddy and compromise with this type of evil, but when you compromise with evil, you become evil yourself. You can't compromise with it. So it's believe. So Christ pre provided freedom. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, you're now out of the slave market. You're no longer technon, but we us. And it's impossible to go back to technon. When you become 14 years old, as you would in the ancient world, as 13, you're technon. When you're 14, you go through the ceremony and you're we us. Will your age ever reverse and you go back to 14? No. Keep getting older. For some of you, you'd say that's so unfortunate, but it's true. We keep getting older and older and older. And we never go in reverse. So once you reach 14, by analogy, you become weos. Once you believe in Christ, you become weos. And you can never go back. Eternal security. And so you see how Paul is coming at them like a lawyer and like someone who knows something. And yet even today, if there were people here who I know, I could be teaching this and they would probably get very upset because it's eternal security and it makes way too much sense. And then they'll say, but. Sounds good, but. Oh, that sounds nice, but. Oh, you're a good pastor, but. Watch out for people who have butts after everything. They give you a compliment and then a butt. You know what that means? They are butts. <laughs> so Christ provided freedom. I know people do it all the time. He'd be a good pastor, but this, that, and the other. <laughs> Whatever. So who is under the law? Now the entire race is born under the law. We were born under the law. Therefore, when you're born under the law, you're born under a curse. And the law was that made as a curse, as we noted from Deuteronomy. Now, what the law does for us is it proves to us that we are sinners and bankrupt. Just like a fence proves to you, if you jump a fence, you know you violated the law and that you are trespassing. And if you see a sign that says no trespassing and you... <coughs> trespass anyway and go fishing you're breaking the law and we've all broken the law I did it one time probably more than once but uh, probably way more than once but there was uh, this um, 
place to go fishing said no no trespass and they had a pond but they hadn't built this place yet it was wrong to do but I did it they had this pond and it was just loaded with fish and some of my friends said hey let's go fishing here and there was no trespassing sign they hadn't built the fence they hadn't built the neighborhood and I said sure let's go fishing so I trespassed and went fishing and caught a lot of fish it was against the law and I knew I was trespassing and the law was made so that we would know that we're sinners. So that we would know that we uh, have done wrong and that we are bankrupt. And then we realize that the wages of sin are death and that we're born spiritually dead. And we realize there's nothing we can do. Once you break the law, you realize you're cursed and there's nothing you can do except believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you believe, you're redeemed. And then you're adopted as an adult son meaning you're not under the law anymore. No more curfew. No more following Sunday as a day of rest. Although you might like to, you don't have to. 4.6, Galatians 4.6 And because you are habitually and absolutely adult sons, here we have the Greek word, because you are habitually and absolutely adult sons. Now in your Bible it should say adult sons and you should wonder why it says adult sons here and just children there. There's meaning. Adult sons referring to huios. <laughs> Excuse me. Transliterated. H-I-O-S. H-I-O-S. And because you are habitually and absolutely adult sons, we are. God, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts once and for all, calling Father Abba. And that just means Father, Father. It's just two different languages. Paul wrote Greek, and then he wrote his language, Aramaic. So Paul wrote Father, Father, actually. He just put it in two different languages. Meaning that the Jews can say Father from the Holy Spirit and that the Gentiles who speak Greek can say Father. Everything has meaning. He's not just saying Father Abbas for some spiritual thing. He's trying to teach us something. Father, you can say Father in the Greek referring to Gentiles. Why? The Holy Spirit says it in Gentiles. Or you can say Abba, which is Aramaic for the Jews, means the same thing. The Holy Spirit is in you and it cries out, Father. Now why is Paul saying the Holy Spirit cries out, Father, Father? You know what that means? It means when you're filled with God, the Holy Spirit, you cry out for doctrine. And what cry out means is you want it. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you could care less. And if you wake up one day and you're doing all this and all that and the other and you find yourself not wanting Bible doctrine, there's one reason and one reason only. You're not filled with the Spirit. You're grieving, you're quenching the Spirit, and therefore you're grieving and quenching the Spirit calling out Father, Father, which means it's calling out for doctrine and wants you to have it. You won't get that anywhere else either. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll want Bible doctrine, and that's why the Spirit calls out Father, Abba. And then again, the two different languages, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles, meaning the Holy Spirit was given to Jew and Gentile alike, and the spiritual life of Jew and Gentile is exactly the same, and there is no Mosaic law, and you won't hear that taught like that anywhere. Not in Galatians that I know of has that been taught. So the Holy Spirit was given to us to execute the Christian way of life. The Holy Spirit has been given to you to execute the Christian way of life. You cannot execute the Christian way of life by the Mosaic Law. You should know that by now by studying Galatians. I've let about Galatians speak for itself. I've told you, I've given it to you. The Bible really can't speak for itself. It needs a communicator. But it does speak for itself in that I've just explained it to you. That's all. I'm the communicator. You could have read it and you wouldn't have got anything out of it. It does need a communicator, 
But when it's communicated, it does speak for itself, and you should believe it. If you don't believe it, well, you don't have to. So the Holy Spirit was given to us to execute the Christian way of life, not the law, not works, not taboos. And again, I'll ask you one more time, as I asked you on Friday, how are you spiritual? And don't say it out loud. Think it to yourself. And if you can answer how you're spiritual, you might be doing all right. If you can't, you're not doing all right. How are you spiritual? It's very simple. If you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, you are in a state of spirituality. And how are you filled with the Spirit? If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That means you will then be filled with the Spirit, but then you have to follow up. You can't be mad. See, you might be mad, name your sin, and then be mad right afterwards. Well, you're forgiven for being mad for those hours before you name the sin. Then you go right back out of fellowship the few seconds after you name that sin by becoming angry again. And you might have to name that sin a million times in a day. That's an exaggeration. But you might have to name it many, many times in a day just to make sure you're filled with the Spirit and that's exactly why God gave you First John 1 John 1.9. So you would do that. Not a license to sin, a license for you to live the spiritual life. A license for you to stop sinning and to remain filled with the Spirit as long as possible. I'm not always filled with the Spirit. But the more you grow in grace and in knowledge, the more you will be. The longer in a day you will know you'll be filled with the Spirit. If you go all day mad, irritable, in a bad mood, running around just being grumpy, you're not filled with the Spirit. Just refer to Galatians 5.22. What it say? Patience. Patience, of, of patience about what? Patience toward others. One of the biggest problems, especially in marriage, as we've noted, and among friendships and everything else, is people lack grace orientation enough to be patient with each other. And part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. And that's the spiritual life. So there are believers who are never filled with God the Holy Spirit. Well, they were the moment they believed, but then after that, they never learned how to be filled with the Spirit. They never learned rebound. And they live out their lives in carnality. As a result, they build up scar tissue on the soul. And as a result, they are losers in their spiritual life. And they are dragging this nation into the mud. And when this country goes under, and it will, don't you go around blaming a politician. And don't you go around blaming Hillary Clinton if she wins, she may not, but whoever wins, whoever's in power, and people now blame George Bush, but whoever's going down or whoever's in authority in the presidency, we're commanded to have respect for. I don't care who it is. In the Bible, we're commanded to pray for people in leadership. But if whoever's in leadership and this country goes under, don't blame them. If gas prices go up to nine bucks a gallon, don't blame the president and the Congress, although there's a lot to go around. Don't do it. Blame who? Yourselves for not executing the spiritual life. And if you have executed the spiritual life, don't blame anybody. Although you know who it is. It's those believers who have... It's believers, by the way. Unbelievers aren't bringing this nation down. They're under the same laws we are. Believers are bringing this nation down by not forming a pivot, by not growing in grace and in knowledge enough so that God can bless from Dekaiosune, from his justice, so that he can approve of our experiential righteousness. And if God can look down and see five, six, seven percent of believers having experiential righteousness from the justice of God, he can say, I will bless them and that nation. I will bless the remnant and that nation. But we're losing it out in terms of a remnant. <coughs> we just don't have one anymore. And it's all because of arrogance and what will happen is everybody will blame everyone else and they will weep bitterly and it's going to be sad. And they're not even going to know why unless there's a turnaround. And there needs to be. And Galatians actually tells us this. We're heirs. Let's look at Galatians 4, 7. This is the result of our adoption. We've been adopted. We've become adult sons. We are. 
as a result. So you are no longer a slave, but an adult son, weos. And since you are an adult son, then you are an heir of God through the instrumentality of Christ. By agency of Christ, you probably have in Christ. Then you are an heir of God through the instrumentality of Christ. It means we're an heir. What do heirs do? They share in everything Christ is. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you share in everything. You share his eternal life. You share his righteousness. You have everything Jesus Christ has. There's only one thing now you need to do. Use it. Christ was given these unique assets in the hypostatic union. You're given the same assets our Lord had. He used them. And if, what would Jesus do? You know what Jesus would do? He would be in Bible class every time the doors were open listening to the word of God. And that's exactly where he was, in the temple. What would Jesus do? Most people say, oh, well, he would turn the other cheek. He would do this and that and the other. No, he would be in Bible class every day. And once he turned 30 years old, he would go into his ministry and he would start throwing money changers out of temples. That's what Jesus would do. He would get to the point of cognitive self-confidence. It takes a lot of self-confidence to throw away people's money. <laughs> Does it not? You'll get beat up if you try to do that. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us to the importance of the things we are noting, and may we come to understand the wonderful things we have in terms of the fact you've adopted us and we share in everything that Christ had. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.